We're beginning a brand new series today uh, entitled Upfit. Upfit is a commercial real estate term. Commercial real estate term that simply means that uh, it refers to a space that had one purpose and then it gets reshaped uh, into another purpose. You've seen it happen when the grocery store goes out of business and the bank comes in. Uh, they probably have a little different setup that needs and a little building process that has to go through a process to get that sh space to be reshaped and utilized for a different purpose. As a church, I, I wanna be a part of a church that is constantly being reshaped for the community around it. The needs of the community change all the time. Every generation is different. Every culture is different. There are elements that as a church, we have to be willing to say, hey, God, this is just a building. We're the people of your church, so reshape us any way you want to utilize us for the purpose that you have ahead. And that fact, every generation would be reached and uh, in a way that makes sense, in a language that they understand because a church is not uh, to be set in stone and never move. It's constantly being reshaped and upfitted for the community around them. But before we talk about a church, here's kind of my outline for the series. Every year, if you're new to this place, uh, we take the first few weeks of the year and talk a little bit about vision and where we're going together as a church. And here's my outline. Week one, it begins with us and uh, in the right hands. If you and I are in the right hands, then we can be shaped to be that kind of a church. In week two, we're going to talk about the kind of church that looks like. When people are gathered together then and in a church like that, what does it look like? for an organization to be upfitted, so to speak, and repurposed continually over and over and over again, constantly being reinvented for the community and meeting the needs that God would intend us to meet around us. And then lastly, what does it look like for our mission to do that? What aspects of our mission as a church going forward are we're gonna wanna talk about what never changes and what must change as a part of our mission because it always has been and always will be about the mission that God has given us, even though that looks different in every culture and every place. So that's where we're going over the next three weeks, okay? So week one, we can talk about organizations all we want. We can talk about churches, but a church is essentially a group of people called out by God gathering together. Those people who are, are following God, now they're gathering together, and as they do, that church then takes on the form and shape of you, because you are the people of the church. And, and so, really, the kind of church you are depends on the kind of people that you have, right? If a church is people, then we have to understand right at the get-go that we have to be willing to say, hey, yeah, I... Depending on who I am, that determines who the church becomes. And so this morning, I want to talk a little bit about what it looks like uh, for all of us to be shaped to serve, upfitted, so to speak, as individuals, as people. It begins with us. Uh, anybody uh, a mechanic here? You, you know how to work on cars? Or you, like, you like tinkering with cars maybe? Okay, yeah, quite a few of you. Okay, so uh, I, I have no idea how to even speak with you, okay? I, I, you guys tell me what's wrong with my car. I, I don't understand it. You could charge me whatever you want. I mean, I don't know. Uh, you, could, you could tell me it's uh, the flex capacitor. I don't know. And, and I would just go, oh, okay, yeah, that sounds familiar. Is that an 80s movie? And no, 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 it's not at all. Uh, you could tell me whatever you want. Because I don't know, but my brothers, when I was growing up, they knew how to work on anything. They could fix anything. I was the athlete, they were the motorheads, and they could fix anything. And so they would make fun of me sometimes, and I would be trying to do something. They'd say, hey, you just need the right tool. Right tool for the right job, man. Right tool for the right job. And so they, they got, man, tools were important in my home. They, they, were like, they were like children almost. They were important. And if you misplaced one of them, that was like crisis, big time. You didn't call 911, but you, you got close. And so the right tool and the right, uh, for the right job was so important that, that I learned that, but unfortunately, there was another truth that didn't, just didn't land with me. Because how many of you have figured out like me that it isn't just the right tool for the right job, it's actually the right tool for the right job 
only if it's in the right hands. <laughs> if it's not in the right hands, then, you know, I don't know what I'm doing. That's when I, be, that's when I take a screwdriver and, like, it becomes a crowbar in my hands, you know? And that's why it bends, and all my, cro all my crowbars, I mean, all my screwdrivers are crooked because I I'm, I'm thought it was to pry stuff out with, you know? Uh, that's why you give me a wrench, and I'm like, well, that's a good hammer, too. You know, it works. I don't, I'll, I'll get it. I'll either loosen it or take it off, try it. So, but the right tool isn't just for the right job. It's the right tool is for the right job only if it's in the right hands. So here's my question for us to begin our year as we talk about church we want to be, talk about the kind of people we are. So whose hands are you in today? Who's shaping you? You say, well, that's a loaded question. I know you're going somewhere with that preacher. Okay, so what are you talking about? Well, I mean, you know, we know that people shape us, right? Like other people shape us. Our world shapes us. Uh, uh, our environment, right? You are what your environment is. We know that we get shaped. And every day, we hear messages all the time. We, we hear uh, commercials that tell us what to buy. And, and we go online, and it tells us uh, how we should look. And, and we hear styles, and they change. And how do we know that? Well, the culture tells us. And, and so we know what, what was cool. My kids tell me all the time, that's not cool anymore. Okay, that's lame. You're lame now. That, that's so yesterday. Uh, no, I, I don't know. I don't know. I, that's why you have children, to tell you these things, right? That's what I thought. I know. But so you, you're told, like, hey, this doesn't work anymore. It used to work, but no, it doesn't work anymore. Now, that was good. Now, this is better. Oh, you, that's so, that, that computer is so slow. Remember back when we used to dial up for a connection? You remember those days? Some people are like, what are you told? Dial what? Yeah, dial, ch -ch -ch -ch. Yeah, anyway, <laughs> but it changes all the time, stuff's always changing, and so our, our world tells us what's in, what's cool, how, uh, what's uh, technologically advanced, what isn't, what expectations you should have, they tell us everything, and, and people, we know that we all grew up with people, they were the best people you had, you know? <laughs> they, were, they were the best ones for the job because they were the only ones who took you, all right? Uh, and, and they were the ones, they were the people who helped you go along in life. And whether that was your mother or your father or both your mother and your father or multiple moms and multiple dads or a group of people or a pack of wolves, it doesn't matter. You, 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 had, you had a group around you, people who were kind of pouring into you, but they were broken people kind of preparing you for a broken world and and they had the same culture you had and the same world that you had. And then I think we get shaped too, right? Don't discount yourself. You do some shaping. You do some shaping as well. Like, like you say, man, I, if I wouldn't have done that, then I wouldn't have to do this, right? You respond. You react to your life. You make sometimes really tiny little mistakes. No big deal. No big deal. It's no big deal. But then a whole bunch of those tiny mistakes add up to a bigger mistake. Or you make a really huge mistake, like, oh, no, it's the worst mistake of my life. And there are consequences of that. That begins to shape my direction. It shapes how I, how I respond and what I, where I, I go in life. Listen to this passage in Isaiah chapter 64, verse 8. Yet you, Lord, are our Father. We are the clay. You are the potter. We are all the work of what? Your hand. All the work of what? Your hand. He uses this analogy. Now, I know it's scary to double up on analogies. I just gave you one that a whole series is resting on. And I, and I know this is a, against all rules, okay? But I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to double up the analogies. I'm going to confuse you a little bit. But... The prophet Isaiah uses this illustration to describe a process in our lives. And, and unlike clay, uh, this clay here, uh, we actually have a decision. Clay doesn't have a decision. They, it's just clay. Like, you know that, right? Like, they, I, they can't decide to jump off the table. I mean, in some cartoon or Disney movies that can happen. But, but, but in this real life, they don't decide anything. I can decide what I do with it. Now, I'm either a really good artist or I have no idea even what I'm looking at, and I, I don't know. But you choose who shapes you. You choose who forms you. And so 
the prophet is saying, hey, this is what happens when you're in the hands of God. These are the things. The same prophet, Isaiah chapter 29, said this. You turn things upside down, though, as if the potter were thought to be like the clay. Shall what is formed say to the, the one who formed it? You did not make me. Can the pot say to the potter, you know nothing? And then he goes on in, in chapter 45, the same theme. Woe to those who quarrel with their maker. Those who are nothing but pot sherds among the pot sherds. That's like, that's like dust, okay? Rocks that haven't even become clay yet. Does the clay say to the potter, what are you making? Does your work say the potter has no hands? Woe to the one who says to the father, what have you begotten? Or to a mother, what have you brought to birth? But all the time, we, we come to God that way. I mean, you say, well, I don't even believe that, pastor. I, hey, I respect that. Maybe you don't even believe that we came from God or that these, there's design that was involved and, and maybe you, you think it's more random or, or that scientific process uh, took place. I, I don't know what your beliefs are today, but I'm just telling you, here's my premise, that if this is true and what God is saying is true, then we're actually the ones looking at a creator and saying, what are you doing? And it's like the clay jumping off and going, I, what's going on? What are you doing here? I mean, I don't know, I don't know. You created this beautiful piece of art here and, and now the art speaks and has a mind of its own and says, ah, I don't know, I don't know. I, I just kinda, I, everything exploded and I just came together perfectly like this. Uh, and some of us who've been following God or who believe differently like, even think that's funny, but, but others who don't think it's funny that someone else would believe that someone is out there that created this. But either way, you got to admit that there's an incredible design to your life. Whoever designed it put something so remarkable together. And in fact, in this analogy, the prophet, long before Jesus ever showed up on the scene, this is hundreds of years before he shows up on the scene, Isaiah the prophet is saying, oh, oh, oh. the pot doesn't Ask the potter, what are you doing? There's a process involved. And today, if you want to accept this premise into your life, let me just say this, that there is some prep work that has to be done in your life in order for you to be in the hands of God. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. And the first part of that process begins with what potters refer to as wedging. All the potters out there, you know this term, right? All right. Oh yeah, tons of potters here this morning, I'm sure. And this is what wedging looks like. I brought an image along. It's essentially uh, this part of the process that's very difficult, actually. It takes the block of clay and begins to shape it, okay? It'll pop up in a second, I'm sure. There's an image. I'll pause. They're working on it. So it takes a block of clay and it begins to pound on it. And to the untrained eye, you'd think this is like kneading dough. It's not dough, it's much more firm than that. And it, to the untrained eye, it doesn't know anything about wedging, it just looks like he's pounding a, a block of clay, just pounding on him. And, and, and you may think, well, what in the world is going on? And all of this is involved in taking the impurities out of clay, aligning the clay particles together, and pushing all the air pockets out of the clay. And the potter doesn't stop until the clay becomes pliable, soft, shapeable. It doesn't stop because if it were to stop early or rush this process, you would essentially get this, that if I even pushed on it too hard or gave it a little bit of pressure, it would crumble in my hands because the clay would not be ready to become this yet. It may look good, but it's not ready. You ever felt pressed on, even hit sometimes in life? <laughs> like, you know, you just get to one of those, end of those days. I love those posts that you, we all make, you know? It's been one of those days, and we usually list like three horrible things that have happened, and like, what else can go wrong? That's the worst question ever, right? Because then you always find out. <laughs> That's when you see the, the police behind you or something hard, like, no, cannot believe this. I'm an hour late. 
because of all these things, and now I'm even going to be more late. We don't even want to ask that question because you know what? We're done. We're, we're the clay that jumps off the wheel and says, whoa, whoa, I've, if it's involved in pounding and pressing and pushing, and if you're telling me to follow God involves all these trials, all these difficulties, all these hardships, and I'm not signing up for that. I get enough of that stuff. But here's the interesting thing about difficulties and struggle. You ever notice how it doesn't matter whether you believe in God or not, you got a difficult life ahead of you? It doesn't matter, does it? That's actually a life principle. It doesn't matter what you believe about Scripture. If you, if you and I disagree today, that's okay. Because you got a difficult life, and I got a difficult life, and I bet you if we got together, if we got together and hung out this afternoon, we'd have a whole bunch of stuff to complain about, don't you think? We'd have that in common. You and I, oh, I, I can go down the list. Like, what's latest, my latest surgery, my latest injury. If you're a bunch of old guys standing around, that's what you talk about. And then you start talking about what you used to be able to do before the surgery or before the, so, right? Right? Come on, old guys. You're with me, right? Uh, you look old, sir. You're, you're pretty old, right? right? Sorry. Uh, I didn't mean to do that. I don't do that to everybody who visits, by the way. Don't worry. Uh, so, you know how this goes, right? We all have this in common. All of us have it in common. So, who's shaping you? See, the difference between your difficulties and mine is simply this. I know I'm going to be pounded in life. But I know whose hands are doing it. That's the difference. I had a wonderful opportunity to meet with one of our young adults here at WEAG, uh, she came up through this place, and uh, I really admire her. She's a great person, and um, I, we got together, and I knew she was going through some struggles, but I had no idea um, how great they were. And so when we sat down, she told me how this young, incredible person, full of energy, and full of life, and who I've known and loved and respected for quite some time, this person sat in front of me and told me how their life had been completely and totally changed by a diagnosis of leukemia. I say, that is so unfair. That is so, I can't even believe this. How could this happen? How, how? And, and you know what? She went through the same process, and she described for me how how in shock she was, and, and, and after going through this period of shock, like, this cannot be possible. I, I thought, surely he was going to give me some antibiotic or, or something. I was some kind of virus that I was fighting that's going on and all these symptoms. I, who would even think in somebody who was a young person, uh, like, who would even look on, you know, whatever the, what is it, MD, whatever? What is that, MD something? Yes, thank you. Uh, so... WebMD, who would even go to WebMD and even plunge that in and think, you know, oh, this has got a leukemia. Even if leukemia popped up, you'd be like, what? No. Okay, what other things could it be? It's got to be one of those. So after all that shock, then became the frustration. Like, no, this cannot be happening. Then became the anger. Like, are you kidding me? God, you and I have prayed. I have been praying my whole life. I gave my life to God. Like, this happens to people who, who maybe you need to get their attention, but you've had my attention. You've had my, you've had my life. I've already, I've been sacrificing. You, listen, I've been on the table, man. I, I'm here. What, what else? Are you kidding me? And after the anger came this uh, beautiful place of trust to say, you know, there's... Uh, her form of leukemia has no human cure to it. Um, they went through a chemotherapy process, and she's still in it. She's still in chemo, and, and, and it's become manageable. She's managing it uh, through chemotherapy, but, but this is a manageable disease. It's not a curable one. So she, then she went from there, from the anger to the acceptance and saying, God, if this is what you want from me, then I know I, won't, I cannot place my trust in humans. I, I gotta trust, place my trust in you. I can't even place it in the medical field. I'm just gonna place my trust in you and say, this is me on the table right now. And whatever you're gonna do, I, I have no control of it, but I'm accepting it. And then what she said next completely blew me away, and which is why I asked her permission to share this story. 
because she moved from that to from I'm accepting it, God, I'm accepting Is this what you want for my life? Then use it to thanking him. Now, <laughs> I gotta be honest with you. I, I've, I struggle with where evil comes from and difficulty and struggle. Is God bringing this? Is, is, you know, I read the book of Job like you do. If, if you don't know what that is, the, the book of Job, spelled Job, uh, we say it Job. Uh, uh, his name was Job, and, and if you're, you're reading the chronological Bible, those of you who started the one-year Bible, but you're doing the chronological, you're steeped in Job right now. Because Job happened way a long time ago, like right after creation. And Job is this first amazing individual. God tells the story of how everything was taken from him. All his wealth is gone. He loses his business. He loses his entire family. He's like alone sitting there and his friends are trying to comfort him. And this is what he says. He says, remember to God his prayer in Job 10. Remember that you made me like clay. Will you now return me to dust? And then by the time he gets to chapter 13, he says, though he slay me, yet I will hope in him. Now, I, I get this idea of saying, I get that. Like, Job, that makes complete sense to me. Because what other choice do you have if you're a follower of God? What other choice do you have than to say, God, if you want to give it to me, I have no control over that. I mean, I, I, have, I can't even place my hope in the medical community. I can't place my hope in other people because they fail me all the time. So God, you're the only one I can trust. That makes complete sense to me. But I'm not sure I could go there and say with you and say, thank you, God, for giving me these trials. No, I wouldn't wish these on any. I wouldn't want anybody. I wouldn't want them in my life. I don't want them. But there's this truth that remains consistent that's possible what this young adult showed me, that it's possible to say, I wouldn't want it in my life, I wouldn't want it in anybody else's life, but not only am I accepting it in my life, but I know not just that it had to happen, not just that it had to happen to be ever whatever God was making to me to be, but I'm glad it happened to me. What? See, that's a person who understands that there's preparation involved. You don't just walk out as this. There's a process, and wedging is a part of it in my life. And the more pliable I become, then the second step of the process can take place. When I begin to be shaped, I get, begin to be shaped. Now, now the clay is moldable. Now it's shaping, and as I, I, as I begin to put my hands, the pressure around it, the pressure as the wheel spins begins to shape something, move in something. When I press my fingers into the clay, it's soft, it's pliable, it moves, and it rises up, and it begins to take shape and take form as the potter has designed See, when, when I'm shaping my life, I'm limited by my own design. I'm limited by my own creativity even. Like, I'm not a very artistic person. I, I don't, I'm pretty sure. In fact, I'm 100% sure, unless God just zapped me with some, that I could not make this. I'm 100% sure. In fact, I'm 100% sure that I couldn't get this to become that, okay? I, I couldn't do it. Because I'm limited by my artistic ability. And when I'm shaping things, I, I, I can only do so much. You know, you say that all the time, right? I can only take so much. I can only do so much. And yeah, because you, you got limits. That's why we're called humans, okay? We don't, we don't, we're not. I mean, it's fun to talk about, and it's fun to think about superheroes, but we're just the ordinary ones. We don't fly, okay? We try, but we don't. We can't overcome anything. We try, but we can't. We say, I'm good, no matter what happens. I'm good, I'm good. But it hurt. See, to go from this to this, that's an artist who knows what they're doing. And he knows exactly the amount of pressure that you need in your life. 
He knows exactly the amount of difficulties and struggle that will make your life pliable, that will get you to a place where you are being shaped. And let me tell you, when he is the one shaping you, the prophet Isaiah in chapter 45, you can read it later, goes on to describe that when he, the potter, is shaping the clay, then who is the clay to say to the potter that why did you make me this way? He created the heavens, he spoke and the earth existed. He spoke and we came from the dust of the ground and he breathed life into us as human beings. And, and, and who are we to say? He's the one who put the stars in exactly their place and if the earth were off one degree of rotation, everything would collapse and everything would fall apart. If it were one degree closer to the sun, it would burn up one degree further from the sun, it would, it would freeze up. He is the one who holds all of that, and his creativity is limitless. His ability knows no boundaries. Wouldn't you want that person to be shaping you? What if that were possible? What if every trial and every difficulty meant something because it was shaping me? It was shaping me. See, I start here and wedging has to happen and, and then I move to shaping and, and finally, it's an interesting thing because wouldn't you think you're ready to go? Wouldn't you think you'd be like, okay, he has shaped me, I look like this, but here's what happens next with the potter. The potter shelves us. What? Yeah, let me look at this beautiful image that gets created after all this work and it's done on the wheel. You see, if I were to take that image, if I were to take that pottery, and I would take it out into the world, it is still soft, it is still pliable, it is still shapeable, and then the world would hit it or pressure it, and it would collapse because it could not withstand the pressure, the decorations, the specific nature of its use. You see, I have so often wanted to be that clay who said, I'm good. God, you brought me through all the trials. You brought me through all the difficulties. You brought me to this place in life. Go, aren't you gonna use me now? I mean, come on. Look at all these abilities. Look at this wisdom. Look at this uh, perspective that I have that the world should hear about. Uh, you know, look, at, look at all these things. God, you've done it. I'm ready for that business. I'm ready for that relationship. I'm ready for that responsibility. I'm ready for that job title. I'm ready for that type of ministry. I'm ready, and I'm here. I've got my hand raised, and I'm willing to go. Let's go. What does the shelf have to do with that? I remember uh, coming in my life to uh, moving away, and uh, I told you guys many times a story. Those of you who come to our, this place and hear me talk every now and then, you, you've heard me tell stories from my life. And, and I moved away, and, and total wreckage happened. I, I dropped out of ministry. I dropped out of church. I dropped out. Of, I just like, forget it. I'm done. I'm out. And the process and the journey back that God brought me to and the healing in my life that took place was a miracle. In fact, people who knew me then and know me now are just like, wow, like, I don't know how that happened. But God totally changed my life. But during that season, I never expected to be back in ministry. I didn't have that expectation. But the more healing I got, the more in my life, the more gifts that began. I had a totally different perspective. In fact, I had a relationship with God that I'd never had before. And it was cool to think and dream a little bit about what would it look like this time around if I, were back in, if I were back doing ministry work and using the gifts that God had given me, what would it look this time around? And so I began to kind of put myself out there with God and say, God, I'm here. God, I'm here. God, I'm here. And those eight years of working in a job that I wasn't created to work and working different businesses and, hey, they did fine and all that stuff, but it, that wasn't the point. It wasn't what I was meant to do. You ever feel that way? It's like, God, hey, it's like he looks over at the shelf and you're like, hey, 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 hey. You know, when you're class, you couldn't get the hand high enough. You just push it to the teacher, teacher, teacher. You know, I can't talk, but you can see me. God, that actually hurt a little bit. Sorry. <laughs> but it used to be, I never used to do that. I could still. I got, I'm limited. And God reminds me of that. And then 
He has to kind of like remind me when I'm on the shelf and I'm waiting and I'm waiting and I'm ready to go and put me in, coach. Come on. He's like, yeah, okay. I've got a place for you. It's not there yet. It's not there yet. I got to wait. You got to wait. And I don't even have time. I don't even want to tell you what will happen next. I don't even want to tell you. I don't even want to tell you about the kiln. You know, guys, I don't even want to tell you about the 2,000 degrees that is going to happen. I, I, you're not even ready to hear that. But, like, listen, there's a process involved, and this is where I start. But unless I'm willing to say, hey, God, I'll let you shape me rather than other people, rather than other circumstances, rather than my own mistakes, rather than my own life, God, I want you to be the one who is wedging, who is preparing, who is pressuring. And God, if I know that if I'm in your hands, I'll trust it because I know that you're making me shape, you're, you're shaping me into something. You're molding me. And I'm going to stay pliable for you. And God, if you put me on the shelf, I'll know that's a part of the process. It's not because he forgotten. We look at it as like, God, you forgot about me. He say, no, 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 no. It's a part of the process. It's all a part of it. It's not a waiting game. It's not like God isn't sure how to use you yet. I love that period of my life because you know what? I wasn't waiting for God. I was being shaped by God. I wasn't waiting for him. I was being shaped by him. That changes my perspective on those years. Not one minute on the shelf was wasted. Not one. Every experience I had Everything I'm doing now. I, please, listen, I didn't, I didn't have this in mind. Like, I didn't say, like, okay, God, I could picture myself, like, pastoring a church. I wasn't sure I wanted to be a pastor. Like, God, I don't, I don't want to be a pastor. Dude, I want to have one of those cool jobs. Like, uh, you know, I wanted, I wanted, I had a whole dream, a whole vision. And you finally let go and say, you know, God, do anything. You gave, me the, you gave me the ability to talk. You do what you want with it. You gave me the ability. You, you do what you want with it. God, you gave me. And God, it's your timing. It's not mine. I'm going to stop jumping off the shelf, and I'm just going to let you. And if you want me to tell my story, if you want me to shout it from the rooftops, if you want me to just talk about it with this one person, then God, I'm going to plan. know that this is not a waste of time. It is a part of the time that you want me here. And you haven't forgotten about me. I'm not waiting on God. You're, I'm being shaped by God. I'm not just spinning. I, I'm being shaped by him. I'm pliable in his hands. And the pressure that's coming is shaping me for something that God has for me. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? What if you knew somebody like that? Like, oh, let's not presume it even be you. But you knew a whole bunch of people like that. That were just... They were being shaped by God. God was using everything in their life, the hardships, the difficulties, the great things, everything, all of it, all of it was shaping me into this incredible design. What if a whole bunch of people started getting together who were just like that? They all were like that. What if, like, that became hundreds of people and thousands of people like that? Can you imagine what impact that could have on your world? If thousands of people gathered together, but they were all being shaped by God's design, limitless, nothing that you could possibly come up with, that God's power was in their life working through them in such powerful ways that taking every story and making it count into the ministry and use of God. Can you imagine that church? See, before we can talk, even go there, we got to be the ones answering this question this morning. Who's shaping you? Who's shaping you?